and welcome to the third episode of the Heritage Langham podcast. I'm Heather Payton, and thanks to all the people who've been in touch about episodes one and two. As you probably know by now, Heritage Langham is about saving the fabric of our medieval church, St. Jerome's, in Langham, Pembrokeshire. And alongside that, researching the roots of the Flemish incomers whose descendants built it. We had a good start when we discovered that the rare DNA type of one village resident, retired Deputy Headmaster Norman Roach, was a dead ringer with that of a group of men named Roach in Ireland who are reckoned to be descendants of Langham's 12th century Flemish founder Godebert. I said then that we'd try to catch up with Norman's Irish cousins and in this episode I'll be doing just that. Plus, I'll bet you didn't know that there's a Saint Roach. Well, we'll be hearing about him and his dog and a bit of this. We'll be meeting the medieval orchestra who will be gracing our planned celebration of Sir David Roach's wedding with Lady Joanna in the autumn. Now that particular Sir David turned out to be one of many. Godebert's descendants, having built Roach Castle, took the name de la Roach. Godebert's sons Richard and Rodebert helped Strongbow invade Ireland in 1169 and they stayed to found a dynasty, a remarkable number of whose menfolk were called David. One present-day Sir David Roach can be seen as a leader of the Roach clan in Ireland, with paperwork from none other than the country's president to prove it. I went to meet him at his house in London, and he started by telling me about his ancestors. Our ancestors were part of the Limerick branch. There were essentially three groups of Roaches. One was in Limerick, one was in Cork, and one was in Wexford. We held sway in Limerick off and on for about 800 years. We were never noblemen. We were always, I suppose, burghers. We were good burghers of Limerick. We were mayors of Limerick, several times MPs for Limerick. Mm. And so we were burghers of Limerick. And the the first um, baronet, Roach, he was an MP, wasn't he? Yes, he was an MP. He was in the House of Commons with uh, Daniel O'Connell, who was Mm. his closest... um, friend or political friend. When the um, coronation honours came out in 1838 for the Queen Victoria's tour of Ireland, Daniel O'Connell was asked by Lord Melbourne to pick a couple of chaps uh, to give baronetcies to, and he gave one to his friend David Roach, which he didn't pay for. (laughs) Well, a major element in Ireland of course, was the religious divide. And one example of how the Roaches suffered was Morris, Lord Fermoy, and his land was seized by Cromwell in, I think, 1652, and he and his family became destitute. Oh, that happened to a lot of them. Oh, yes, we've had lots of lands taken away and lots of heads chopped off and hangings over the, over the years. But in, in Limerick, they sort of worked it differently. They had to work the system so that at least one was a Protestant and one was a Catholic so that if anything should go wrong, they would be able to hold on to their lands, having learnt the hard way. Mm. How far back can, um, can you trace your direct line? Well, in theory, we go back to about 1702, because that is the, after the period of the Jacobites and King William taking over, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, at that stage, in, the, in that extraordinary period in Ireland, between 1690 and already 1700, three quarters of a million people left Ireland. It was an enormous exodus. So clearly before that period, we were a Catholic family, and in order to be in power in 1702, you had to be a Protestant. So I think somehow we became Protestants. The Roaches did awfully well after they left Wales, in fact. Why do you think they did? I suspect that the Roaches, being ambitious types, found that in that part of Wales, most of the good land had already been taken by somebody else, and so went to Ireland for, for, for better pickings. So some did well, and, and some obviously did not so well. But the big divide has been the, the 1690s, 1691 period. The Battle of Ockram, of course, was fought in Limerick, and that's when the people decided who they should have as ancestors and who they should not have as ancestors. It was pretty much a life-and-death thing. So you know, the fact that we 
haven't got the records is, is a shame, but having some of those records was pretty dangerous in those days, which is why I'm really quite pleased about your finding records through the DNA. I'm delighted to hear that you're, we are now descended from somebody from ancient Egypt, which is excellent. <laughs> Egypt via, um, I think it's northern Italy and then Belgium. <laughs> right. Um, no, I think, I think definitely I think I've taken on board being an ancient Egyptian, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you also mentioned, um, David, that there is a Saint Roach. Now, we don't know about this. Tell us about it. Well, indeed, there is. Uh, St. Roach is uh, also known as Rock Horoc or Rocco, because he's buried in, in Italy, in Venice. It's a story of the, rather like the prodigal son, but it's a sort of prodigal son without the happy ending. In about 1340, we think, somebody called uh, Roach left his father's castle and went off as a mendicant friar, healing the sick as best he could. And if you remember, the 1340s is when about a third of Europe was died of the plague. Anyway, he got the plague and retreated into a cave where a dog brought him some bread. And he survived the plague. And having survived the plague, he was obviously then able to go and help look after people with the plague. And so he became revered as a healer and when you see uh, his, his images anywhere, you will always see him showing on his, on his left knee a scar from the plague and a dog next to him with a loaf of bread in his mouth. And in fact, every year on St. Roach's Day, uh, we have a service on a hill in Sussex and people are encouraged to bring their dogs to the service. Anyway, he returned many years later uh, to his father's castle in Montpellier where he was not recognised. He was thrown into the dungeon where he died. And so there was not a happy ending. When they found out who he was, he was then revered from his history and his past. But that is St Roach, and, and the convocation from various popes still exists today. Sir David Roach talking to me in London. Now, the Roach clan, in fact, spawned some colourful figures, including a chap known as James the Swimmer, who carried dispatches to blockaded British warships during the Catholic siege of Londonderry in 1689 by swimming the length of the River Foyle. He then spent the rest of his life trying to get the reward money promised to him at the time. Now, in the autumn, when the building work on the church is completed, we'll be marking the 700th anniversary of the wedding of a previous Sir David Roach with Lady Joanna, also a member of the Roach clan, and whose effigy will be welcomed back to St. Jerome's when the builders move out. Between you and me, it's actually the 701st anniversary, but what's a year after so long? Anyway, it gives us a great excuse for a medieval banquet with food, dancing and possibly embarrassing attempts at medieval fancy dress. And, of course, music. La Volta are an early music group based in Pembrokeshire who will be playing for us on the night. My name is Stuart Evans. I started the early music group La Volta. Um, the first beginning of the group might have been uh, a colleague of mine at Green Hill School. I, I'm a peripatetic music teacher. That was one of the schools I was teaching at. He wanted to do some Tudor music at Carew Castle. So he asked if I could fill, fill in for him and I filled in and I really enjoyed it. What's different then about medieval music? I mean, how, how would you characterise it? Well, it, it, there are certain things in common with folk music. Uh, to start with, it's monophonic. Uh, there is just one line. If more than one person plays the tune, what tends to happen is it turns into a heterophonic performance that you'll have somebody else playing a slightly embellished or, alternatively, a simplified version of the tune Underneath, instead of proper harmony, you would have a drone. And in medieval times, how would that music be treated? Would people be dancing to it? Would they be singing to it or what? 
Well, there, there was music for different occasions. Uh, there was music in church, of course, starting with plain song, which eventually turned into polyphonic compositions. But the, there's always been dance music outside. There's been peasant music. Half the West, along with a lot of towns, employed a group of waits. That is a group of musicians, possibly about three, who were given livery a uh, grey uniform, I think, with taffeta and uh, green buttons as well. They became very versatile musicians. And you've just put all your instruments away, so you're going to hate me if I say, can we try some of them out to hear them? Well, we can indeed, yes. You, you had one earlier that looked like bagpipes. Well, that's because they were bagpipes. Okay. They were English medieval bagpipes. Again, ubiquitous throughout the Western world, really, bagpipes. Okay, so it's being put together and it is in, indeed a bag and it's got some wooden, light-coloured wooden pipes sticking out of it. Yeah, it has one chanter, that's the melody pipe, and one drone pipe. tuned the drone up beforehand really but that gives a rough idea of it anyway that's, that's brilliant thank you very much my name is basil foro i play sitton bass file harp and i blow the crumb horn and the recorder i was a physics teacher and i was teaching physics one afternoon in my um, a-level group and i turned round to the board and there just out of my line of sight, Stuart came up to me and he said, I hear you've got a harpsichord, I hear you've got a crumb horn and a harp. Would you like to come and join our group? You say crumb horn. I always wanted to know what a crumb horn is. Well, a crumb horn is a wind cap instrument, like a bagpipe. It looks actually, it looks like a walking stick, right. a hollow walking stick. There we are. It's got a double reed at one end and it's got a cap over the double reed. So your mouth doesn't touch the reed. And you make some of your instruments? Yes, I have made some instruments, yes. Any of the ones you've got here? Yes, I made the harp and I made the sitan. And the harp is gorgeous, it's wood, it's polished wood and it's, um, it looks like it might have taken a long time. Well, it didn't take as long as the sitan. That uh, is a design adapted from the Book of Kells. And on the, in the Book of Kells, that design is three-eighths of an inch long. So I, I expanded it. <laughs> and <laughs> and the, the sitan, um, it's, it's a stringed instrument. Yes. Yes, the sitan is, I suppose, it was around since the 15th century, and some rather elaborate ones survive in, in various collections and museums. This one um, is based on an instrument in the Ashmolean Museum in, in Oxford. My name is Lynn Childs. I play the uh, Gemshorn, a couple of different recorders, a uh, couple of different shawms. Yeah. A shawm? What is a shawm? Well, they're, they're really medieval oboe. I used to play the oboe, so right at the very, very beginning, or when we were first formed, it, was, it wasn't easy for me to play shawm because they're not easy things to play, but at least I had played reed instruments before. And I'm Tom Rawlins, and I play the uh, recorders, crumb horns, uh, the symphony. The, the symphony, now it's, um, it's a wooden box, and it's got keys on it, and it's got a bit cut out in the front, and it's got handles either end. What does it do? It's basically an early form of hurdy-gurdy. There's a handle on one end which you wind to produce a, a drone-like sound, and then the tangents on the front can be moved to play different notes. And so on. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marion Goodfellow, and I play string instruments mainly, but uh, I've also been known to play recorders and uh, crumb horns and drums and percussion and whatever is needed at the time. You were playing a violin earlier. Was it an ordinary old bog-standard violin or was it a special one? The violin was a bog-standard violin, as you say, but the medieval fiddle, of course, is a copy of an early instrument. Yeah. My name is Regina Robertson. I'm a recorder player and I play the rebec. The rebec? 
That's another one I've not heard of. Yeah, it's a pear-shaped string instrument with three strings. Mm. And it came to Britain with the Crusades, with the Crusaders. Oh. Can we hear a bit? The music and the members of La Volta, and as well as playing for us at the wedding banquet, they'll also be providing the music for the app and the DVD that'll bring Langham's history to life. That's it for the month. Do tell us what you thought of this episode via the website and anything you'd like to hear in future editions. As ever, huge thanks to our lovely financial backers, the Heritage Lottery Fund and CADU. Thanks to them and thanks to you for listening. But before we go, do you fancy a bit more of La Volta? <laughs>